Soviet Union operated with three major tank variants during the period of Cold War, T-64, T-72 and T-80. All three of them went through a lot of upgrades and changes over the years of their service, where T-80 usually received the best treatment and T-72 sadly was made to be cheaper for mass production. In this video we will cover why the T-72 was inferior to its brothers on more of a technical level, there were actually some pretty good things about it. You can develop your own tanks in Call of War! Call of War is a free online strategy game that gathers millions of players worldwide. You fight up to 99 other players in real time in games that can take weeks to complete. The game features World War II historically accurate maps and units, but allows you to create your own path and rewrite history. Your objective is to take over the world, define your own strategy, build powerful armies by combining dozens of different unit types such as infantry, tanks, planes and fight for world domination in a challenging PvP environment. Call of War is fully cross-platform. Use your diplomatic skills and forge alliances with other players on both PC and mobile devices with the same account. I have set up a special game of Call of War for the first viewers that click the link in the description. Go to the website or app, type my name in the search bar and enter the password Red Effect. The slots are limited, so don't lose time. And Red Effect viewers are getting a special gift. Click on the link below to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. The offer is available only for 30 days. So click the link in the description, choose a country and fight your way to victory in epic real-time battles. The first T-72 variant to enter service was T-72 Ural in 1973. It was made as Nijinita Gil's response to the problems that Kharkov's T-64 and T-64A tanks were facing, mainly with reliability. Even though the reliability issues with T-64s were mostly fixed, T-72 was liked for its simplicity and cost, while also being very comparable to the already existing T-64A. The major difference between the two was really just the remotely operated heavy machine gun present on T-64A. This is kinda important to be honest, and to this day no T-72 in Soviet and Russian service ever received a remotely operated machine gun. This means that the commander has to expose himself to enemy fire in order to use a turret mounted machine gun. A lot of it changed in 1975 when T-72 Ural 1 entered service. T-72 Ural 1 received better armor protection, it got thicker turret armor and most importantly received a better hull armor composition. While T-64A and T-72 Ural had 80mm steel plus 105mm text slide plus 20mm steel, T-72 Ural 1 had 60mm steel plus 105mm text slide plus 50mm steel, both angled at 68 degrees. While the entire composition is 10mm thicker, the most important factor is the much thicker back plate, which is much more effective at stopping degraded projectiles. T-72 Ural 1 also got a laser rangefinder, which is better than coincidental one used on T-72 Ural and T-64A, sometime during its production. It should be noted that the new turret and probably the new hull armor appeared in 1977, and were used on later T-72A variant, but at the time when new armor appeared, T-64B had already entered service. T-64B received a laser rangefinder, it also got crosswind and temperature sensors. Another big improvement in the fire control system of T-64B is the automatic lead. Automatic lead calculates the speed of the moving target. The sight can then move left or right, staying on target, while the turret turns to compensate for the target's movement, making it possible to shoot at moving targets with pinpoint accuracy. Prior to that, gunners had to guess where to aim and shoot to hit the moving targets. But with automatic lead, all you have to do is keep your sight on the target and the fire control system will do everything else for you. You just aim, wait a second for calculations to take place and shoot. Yet another improvement is the added ability to fire anti-tank guided missiles, which can also effectively be used to shoot at slow-flying helicopters. Now, the turret of T-64B was improved compared to its predecessor, but the biggest issue about the tank was that the hull protection remained the same as the one of T-64A, which means that the hull was less protected than the one of T-72 Euro 1. It should also be noted that T-64s used 700 horsepower opposed piston engine, which was inferior to T-72's 780 horsepower V-shaped diesel. This meant that T-72 was more mobile. 
Two years later, in 1978, Omsk Transmash introduced the ATB. The ATB pretty much had the same fire control system as the T64B. Laser rangefinder, crosswind sensor, automatic lead and ATGM ability. The key difference being that the T80B used a gas turbine engine, which was more powerful than T64's 700, and T72's 780 horsepower diesels, being able to produce 1000 horsepower and later 1100 horsepower. But it had armor pretty much comparable to the one of late T72 Euro 1, which is of course better than the T64B's armor. Together with new armor, T64B's fire control system and the best performing engine, it was the best tank that they had developed, but of course it came at a price. A year later T72A entered service. It wasn't really great, it was really comparable to T72 Euro 1 in performance. It had the same armor as T72 Euro 1, so the protection was comparable to T80B, which means T64B still had the worst protection out of all three, but T72A still had the worst fire control system, with no automatic lead, no wind sensor and no ability to launch ATGMs. I should say that T-72A got a new gun, but all of the variants were getting new guns as they were being upgraded. I go slightly more in depth between the differences of the mentioned T-72 tanks in my T-72 spotters guide video, so make sure to check it out. One important thing to note though is that the design of T-72's autoloader is much safer than the design of T-64 and T-80's autoloaders. T-80 tanks practically inherited the same autoloader design from T-64, but the designers of T-72's had a better idea. T-64's autoloader has the charges placed vertically, and the actual projectiles horizontally. This means that the chances of hitting the charges is much easier if the tank is penetrated. T-72 autoloader carousel has the charges basically on the bottom of the tank, horizontally. There is also a thin sheet steel cover, covering the carousel in order for the crew to be able to stand if needed. Even though it wasn't really meant to protect the ammo, it can actually serve as protection against small fragments. This is a much safer design, not to mention that the T-72 has an ejection system for the spent duds, while in T-64 and T-80 they are returned to the carousel, which means that some of the remaining fumes enter the crew compartment. T-72 also had a lot of interchangeable parts with older models and even older tanks, such as being able to use wheels from T-54. T-64 and T-80 couldn't really pride themselves with such things. After T-72A entered service, some very important events took place. After 1982 Lebanon War, Syrians sent captured Israeli Magath tanks together with M111 Hetz ammunition. Soviets were shocked to find out that M111 APF SDS could penetrate their tanks, since their goal was complete immunity from 105mm APF SDS, and they didn't like what they saw, so they first installed extra steel plates on the front armor, but this was just a stopgap. Another important thing is that Contact 1 explosive reactive armor was being developed by Nii Stade. This ERA could degrade the penetration of hollow charges a lot, rendering NATO ATGMs and rocket launchers practically useless, and all new Soviet tanks were going to get it. Harkov made T-64 BV. This tank featured an improved hull armor which was now better than the T-72A's hull, and much better than basic T-64B, and it also received the Contact 1 explosive active armor. T-80 BV also had the same upgrades when compared to T-80 B, but T-72 did not stop there. They actually put a lot of effort this time, and they developed a brand new armor package. While Soviet tanks used basic sandwich-style armor, with either text light quartz or corundum layers between steel, T-72B received something much better, a type of Nira armor called reflecting plates. This meant that T-72B had much better protection than both T-80BV and T-64BV, on top of also having the Contact 1 ERA, but sadly this was its only advantage. Good thing though is that this time it could actually fire 8 gems. It still lacked automatic lead, but they made it so that the fire control system would display the number of mils once you laser a moving target, which were present on the reticle, so you would move the sight on the corresponding number to shoot at a moving target. It wasn't as easy to use as automatic lead, but it was a cheaper solution. But again, it wasn't perfect, this still meant that the T-72B had inferior fire control system. 
Good thing though is that T72B was more mobile than T64BV. Even though T64BV weight increased with added ERA and improved armor, it still retained the 700 horsepower engine, while T72B received a 840 horsepower engine. The worst part though, by far, is the fact that for the entirety of its service in USSR, T72 never received a crosswind sensor. This meant that the tank was less accurate than its Soviet colleagues. In 1987, T-80U tank entered service, and oh boy was it good. It didn't have Contact 1 ERA, no. It had Contact 5, which could degrade the penetration of both high-explosive anti-tank and APF SDS projectiles. It had improved base armor compared to T-80BV, so it was somewhat on par with T-72B's armor, maybe not as good by default, but the tank had Contact 5, which drastically improved its protection compared to its counterparts. In 1987, the T-64 production was stopped in Kharkov, in favor of the T-80UD tank, which was a T-80U tank with a diesel engine instead of a gas turbine. And since Nizhny Tagil had to keep up with Omsk and Kharkov, they made T-72B model 1989, which is practically just a T-72B tank with Contact 5 ERA. Even though its protection was now on par with T-80U's, its fire control system was far behind, and its mobility was also worse. In total, 13,100 T-64s were produced during the Cold War, around 6,200 T-80s and around 17,800 T-72s, all in USSR for domestic use. So, as you can see, even though T-72 was less effective than the other two, because it was simpler and cheaper, they could afford and produce more of them. Was it worth it though? Well, kinda. Keep in mind that all variants are included in that number, and not all were in service at the same time but T-72s always outnumbered both T-64s and T-80s in active service, especially T-80s, that were the most expensive because of their gas turbine engine, but have no doubt T-80s were the best of the three. T-72s were also regarded as most reliable out of three, so that's a plus. But their fire control system made them less accurate, the lack of wind sensor made it less accurate even when standing still, shooting at stationary targets. The lack of automatically made it even less accurate when engaging moving targets. So, what is your opinion? Was its lacking fire control system enough to make it the worst, or did the sheer numbers compensate for the lacking performance? That would be all. If you like my content, you can consider supporting me on Patreon. And if you can't, leave a like on the video or subscribe if you're new. That also helps a lot. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Have a nice day.